join when they can. So hello everyone, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. This is our second interactive webinar in our series, How to Build a Successful Allied Health Practice. So today's session will review the financial management aspects of the practice and why the general accepted accounting principles don't always work. So my name is Charles Broadfoot and I'm a professional development officer with Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. So I'd like to begin the session today by acknowledging the first peoples and traditional custodians of all the lands in which we are meeting on and pay my respects to elders past, present and those emerging. So today's session is being recorded. So just to be aware of that and the recording and Marcus's PowerPoint slides will become available from tomorrow in our PHN's education library on our website. So if I can just ask you to keep your microphone on mute during the presentation. If you do have a question though, um, feel free to, to hit that raise hand function. So this will either be in the top right hand corner or um, for some of you, if you're using a web-based version of Microsoft Teams, it may be in a panel at the bottom in the center. Um, so yeah, use that raise hand function um, and we'll invite you to, to unmute and ask your question. Alternatively, of course, you're welcome to type your questions in the chat and uh, Marcus will see these or I can read them out for you. Um, we have allocated some a little bit of time right at the end of the webinar uh, for some last minute Q&A. So to make this session more interactive, we are using Slido again for some poll questions throughout um, and we would love you to participate and please know that um, you joining and your answers are all anonymous. So, you know, don't worry about that. We'd love your honest answers. Um, You'll see on the screen there, we've got the QR code. My recommendation would be to do that now. So probably easiest just to use your phone and scan that QR code. That'll take you to Slido um, and we'll be ready to go from there. Alternatively, you can just um, head to slido.com and enter our event code, which is AH2. Um, so just keep an eye out and we will tell you when we're launching polls, we'd love you to participate. Um, I'll also post the link to Slido in the chat um, after my intro. So we're also doing the evaluation survey on Slido, so that's in the exact same place. I'll launch that at the end, so please fill out the evaluation survey. We'd love your feedback and we'll also need that to issue you with a certificate of attendance if you would like one. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, our speaker for today and our speaker for the series, uh, that's Marcus Croak. So Marcus has been a business coach since 2005, which was a natural progression from owning businesses and being employed across many areas, including retail, importing, wholesale, transport and education. He has involved, evolved his skills to coaching numerous businesses um, and business owners to become successful leaders of high performance teams. So thanks everyone for joining us. Feel free to post any questions for me in the chat as well, but I'll hand over to Marcus to start the presentation. Thanks very much, uh, Charles. Great to be here with you all again today. Apologise if I look around a bit. I've got screens everywhere with uh, different things on them to find our way through. The profitable practice is what we're on about today. And in particular, I want to get to that point of no more cash headaches. So we will be going through your financials. Hopefully you've looked at the um, worksheets that I've sent out. One is was simply to for you to be able to record some numbers that might help you today, your own numbers. And the other one was a checklist, which I really might not refer to today. It, it's uh, there for you to go, oh, I don't have those things in place, or yes, I do, and here's what I need to work on for the for the next part. As Charles said, uh, please you know, raise your hand, type in chat, or if you really want to come off mute, we do have a short time left at the end for questions. That's uh, about 27 seconds. So you know, make the most of it along the way. Also, we will be putting out the the question sheet so you can ask questions like we did last time and i will answer them i'll do a video response on those that will go up in the uh, education section that charles has there and they're available for you from last time as well and if you you have watched last time and you have still have some questions or you haven't watched it and you're going to go and watch it please do that and ask any more questions doesn't matter when they get asked i will answer them along the way um, so today we're talking about financials, basically, and then next time we're talking about how to make the money. The next two are really about how to make the money from it. So the profitable practice is about understanding the financial position of the business and the cash management strategy to put in place. Then uh, in the next session, what we'll be doing is looking at the 
the formula for profit so that you know you can work out where you need to go to within your practice within your organization in order to generate the profits along the way so we're just hopping now we said this slide and here's the first question for you today this is these questions today are really uh, quite driven around the giving me some information to build up about uh, where people are uh, so we can address the, the this webinar towards that but it also gives us a few statistics so here we are how would you rate yourself on financial literacy uh, five very high means i've got this covered i know everything there is um, to know about it or reasonably and one very low like i don't have a clue like just you know whereabouts are you um, in that so what have we got uh, oh okay so 33 percent of people are, are pretty good at them that's awesome well done um, and uh, two-thirds of the people sort of okay or below so to me that means that uh, if you're you know four you probably know how to read a profit and loss and balance sheet um, if you're below three maybe you're not very good at reading those things or you can read a profit and loss but not the the balance sheet so that's awesome with that thanks for putting um, that in that's good so here's what people tell me about their financials. The typical thing that a, that a business owner would say to me is, um, number one, that they don't really look at them. Their bookkeeper takes care of all of that stuff. And the other thing they'll tell me, which we'll come back to later on in the cash management strategy, is uh, my accountant tells me I'm, I'm doing okay, but I don't seem to have any cash. So we want to address those today. I want to address, Charles mentioned the generally accepted accounting principles. So we're going to explain why it is that your profit and loss and balance sheet might not work. And, and the big thing is most people simply look at their profit and loss and the profit and loss financials tell you only a little bit about what's going on in your business. And that's the number one problem with those financials. If all you're doing is looking at the profit and loss, you are getting a peek into what's happening in the business, but it's not the full story. It's a bit like, uh, you know, going along to the GP and and taking your blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, at the moment, we're talking about the Shane Warne effect that I'm seeing on TV. You know, people are going out and getting their hearts checked, but you don't just go along and get your blood pressure taken and your pulse taken. You know, your profit and you could, they could be good, but it doesn't mean that you have a bad you don't have a bad heart you know that would be the thing say with um, Shane Warne I remember a, a police sergeant on the central coast many years ago who rode a bicycle all the time yet had a heart attack on a charity bike ride so you know you get that little piece of information but not the full story that we need so the heart like I go and do the stress test and all that horrible stuff that they make me do running until I drop on a on a walking machine and the um whatever I do, the MRIs, plastic iodine, all that sort of stuff that you guys I'm sure know about and I just endure uh, to get the full story. So that's what we've got to get clear on today. Key mastery areas of your financials, profit and loss, balance sheet, break even you have to know. So the break even is how much money do I need to come in in order to cover the costs of my business and the cash flow of the business. Now, there's a thing there called the statement of cash flows that is the third financial report that is referred to that isn't referred to. That's the problem with it. And it's still a thing where it's numbers on pieces of paper, not necessarily actual cash. So that's what we're talking about. Businesses fail in the first five years. It means that they don't progress. Like, you know, why is it? We, know, we Statistics tell us it's the old 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of businesses that start today won't be around in five years' time for one reason or another. Many of them fail. One of the reasons they fail is no cash flow. The other one is no profit. And that means you end up with no business. Now, you can have profits, apparent profits, because they're on the piece of paper without cash flow. You can have cash flow without making a profit. It really concerns me at the moment, looking particularly at trades businesses that have been very busy throughout COVID and they get busier and busier and busier. They actually get the cash coming in, but they're not necessarily being profitable. It's just that they're getting more and more cash. They're not having leftover money. 
which is the definition of profit, which we will come to. The reason to understand, why do we need to understand these numbers that you have so that you can make better business decisions? So again, if all you're doing is looking at the profit and loss or not looking at it at all, then you're not getting the information that you need to make the best business decisions. Think of your patients and think of if you only got 20% of the information from them, would that be enough to actually give them the, uh, you know, the best diagnosis, the best prognosis, the, the best plan in order for them to become healthy? You need the information that you need to make those decisions, not just part of it. So today, we're going to learn quickly about the profit and loss. We're going to learn about the balance sheet. So we're not doing an accounting course today. We can't do that. Accountants go to university for four years and then they do CPA study and then they do masters and all sorts of things to become excellent at these things. And there's a difference between tax accounting, management accounting. We tend to lump, lump accountants into that one group because most of what we see are tax accountants. Uh, a buddy of mine who also, you know, he's a management accounting, so he can't tell you about tax accounting. He did it at uni, not his specialty area, specialty area management accounting. So very, very different things. How to work out your break even point, which is really crucial that you know how much money you need to be bringing in every day, every week, every month in order to make the, the business work. And it must work if we go back to the purpose of your business purpose of your organization your practice that it must be producing enough money to keep you in business so you can provide the service that you need then we're going to get onto the cash management strategy that i believe will transform your business and your life i certainly use it in my life as well as my business so here's the next question for you on slido how often do you review your financials I might just quickly jump in there, Marcus. I know we've had um, a group of people that have just been trickling in um, into the session. So we are using Slido. If you have a look in the chat, there's a direct link there. Um, if you'd like to participate, we'd love you to. Um, so just click that and it will open up in a browser for you. Put that back there for a sec while people are there. Uh, never, yep. <sighs> for tax, yeah, okay, monthly. Yeah, right. So what we're going to do in the cash management will also allow you a way to be checking on your financials without having to dive into accounting software or have it explained to you, okay? Uh, it, they're really important. At the end of the day, every organization requires money to function. That's the society that we live in. So a not-for-profit still requires money. Wherever it happens to come from, it still requires money a profitable commercial enterprise still requires money. So we've got to get into it. More than monthly is awesome. If you're in retail, you'd be checking that every day. Places like KFC and McDonald's, they'd be able to tell you what was going on hour to hour. That's how they plan staffing and all those sorts of things that happen there. Okay, so it's, it is really important that you know what's happening in your numbers all the time. And the numbers, again, this, this is like, um, you know, later on, we'll talk about prems and problems in the next uh, sessions. It, it's, it is getting that information from your patient that tells you how they're tracking along the place. So we're, we're measuring what's going on in the business. And one of those ways is the financial status of the, of the business. So really important that we get a way of doing that. And again, our cash management strategy will help, help uh, you do that. So some things to consider, your books are up to, uh, up to date. So nowadays, everything's in your accounting software and reconciled each month. Highly suggest that that's an external person that does that, that uh, knows how to use it. Accounting software is really, really easy to use nowadays. And it's like uh, giving me an old manual stethoscope and um, or blood pressure monitor, sorry, and, and asking me to use it. I might think that it's easy to use, but it's not, maybe it's more appropriate to say one of the new modern ones like I've got here because I have high blood pressure and I put it on and it tells me readings. It's easy to use, doesn't mean that I'm good at it. That's a problem with accounting software nowadays. Review your financials on a monthly basis, minimum. Um, a lot of pe people do four weeks. So in your accounting software, you can actually set it to 13 months, 13 four week systems. Have a system for keeping yourself uh, on track. Uh, this 
Thursday, I'm running a day with my clients and our focus is time, how to keep themselves on track with the different things they do, how to establish a diary to make that work. And have your advisor check your numbers. Okay, now, the great bookkeepers are good at this. Um, you, your accountants tend to be tax accountants. One of the things I do with clients is run through their numbers to make sure that they're checked. So just make sure that you are keeping on top of them. Now we're gonna get into the profit and loss. So I, I did uh, send out, and you might have it there, this form here, which was simply to take information from your own profit and loss, which you could fill in from your accounting software to write down what's your income or sales. Now, we know in many industries, people don't like talk, to talk about sales and, and health and allied health is one of those. It's, it's a generally accepted accounting term that we use sales uh, as well as income or revenue turnover sometimes for these sorts of things. So that's all we do is putting that word in there uh, later on. We're going to define sales in a later session as well. And my definition of that is professionally helping people to make the best decisions about the best products or services for their needs. It's not about all the negative connotations that come with it. Uh, COGS or cost of goods sold is the other thing we're going to put in there. Your gross profit, fixed profit, next net profit. I'll put down here from your balance sheet, the most important thing I want to talk about today on there is any loan payments that are going out. So if you're paying off a car, if you're taking, that can be taking drawings or um, director's loans from the business. Uh, it can be if you have a, a, a tax payment plan in place with the ATO, any money that's going out from there is what we want to look at. So those things appear on here. So reasonably straightforward, you've got your sales or income at the, at the top and that should give you a total sales. This is using widgets. I know you don't sell widgets, it's just replacing it saying there's not necessarily just one line, there can be many lines of sales uh, in there. In, in industries, you can break that up into, um, if you're in a hairdresser, use a lot of things from different industries because it's the principles are the same, it's just the examples change. And it's often easier to think about another industry and transfer it across. So in a hairdresser's, they might break up their sales into you know, the number of people that have uh, a wash and dry done, the number of people that, that have a style done, the number of people that have a color done. They might also all be different lines of sales in there so that they can get more information. Then their cost of sales, is the, the, and it's coming up on a slide, so there'll be a definition. And again, you know, Charles has this as a PDF that uh, will be available for you later on. And of course, you can always contact me for more information um, where they, they then break up. So if I sell a red widget, I wanna know how much it costs me to produce. The easiest way of looking at that is what are the materials that went into it and are there subcontractors involved? So if we use that hairdresser idea, again, sometimes what they do is, uh, particularly in America, they actually sell the chair or rent the chair. Happens a bit in Australia. That could be done on a per haircut basis. You get a certain amount. Um, a builder would have a subcontractor uh, come in. And then, you know, what's the materials? In hairdressing, it's, it might be shampoo that we've used or the dyes that we've used. We want to run them through the cost of sales because it's happened. We've only used it because that we've only um, because it's part of the sale that we've made. Okay, so gross profit. So once we've got the sales and income, the just the money that's come into the business, then we take out whatever we've used for materials and subcontractors. Uh, if you have casual workers come in, that could be that that goes on there. Often uh, cleaning is a great example there, where they use lots and lots of casual staff. So that would fit in there. It, the, the expense only happens because the sale has taken place. Again, you can get much more complicated than that with this. We're trying to avoid that at the moment. That leaves your gross profit, the money left over after paying for materials and subcontractors. And then we have the fixed expenses. You know, financials, profit and loss can be set up in different ways. In management accounting, that cost of goods and the income lines are far more detailed. They want to know every cost that goes into every line of income that comes in, so far more detail. Typically, what we do in smaller organisations 
And a small organisation in Australia, we have a different view to say the rest of the, the world. If you have 100 employees in the United States, you're still a small business over there. So the fixed expenses, if we just think of it pretty simply as they happen whether we make a sale or not. If you've got rent on a premises, landlord doesn't care whether you've made a sale, you're paying the rent. Electricity, whilst it might vary a little bit, it's going to happen whether you make a sale or not. It's not directly linked to the sale so much. So they can vary, but they're, they're just happening whether you've made that sale or not. And then down the bottom, you have that magical number, the net profit. So after I've brought in my money, I've paid out all of my expenses, I'm left with my net profit. So what are some of the problems with the profit and loss? Because that's really straightforward. That's perfectly logical. It's just maths, isn't it? I've just got some numbers on there uh, and I work out the maths. Here's the problem. Number one, your profit and loss is taxable income and tax deductible expenses. And there's no GST on here. So it's exempt, it doesn't include GST because GST should really take care of itself. So you don't have those figures on there at the moment. When you're printing out your profit and loss, you have to be aware of, am I on a cash basis, which means it's actual money that's come in and actual money that I've spent, or an accrual basis, which is used, accountants tend to use for tax and goes more towards managing the business, which is tells me um, I've issued invoices this month for something, whether or not I've got paid, I'll get taxed on that, or I've received invoices to make payments, whether I've paid them or not, it's now a tax deductible expense. So you gotta check in on that. That's something for another session. So pretty straightforward, total income or sales minus the cost of sales, the variables, those linked directly to the sale gives us a gross profit. We take away the fixed expenses and we're left with a net profit or loss down the bottom. Just to go over what cost of goods or cost of sales is again. So when we say variable costs, we expect them to vary with the, the sale, but there's other ways of looking at them. Don't get confused because again, something like electricity can vary, fuel can vary, other things can vary, wages can vary, even though people are on um, wages because they're doing overtime or shift allowances, all those sorts of things, but it's just in that relation to the sale. So here's an example um, of this. If your contractors only get paid when seeing a patient, this, then this would be a cost of sales. If your service professional were paid a fixed salary, regardless of whether or not they produced income, this would be a fixed cost. So you might have somebody employed, you've got a physiotherapist practice, a physiotherapy practice, and you've got an employed physiotherapist on a salary, uh, whether they see a patient or not, then that is a, a fixed cost and tends to go below the line. Not hugely important at the moment. Um, one of the things with cost of sales that can confuse people, and again, I don't want to get too deeply into this, product costs, so in that, in that variable cost, that cost of goods, product costs are recorded as an expense when the item is sold, technically. So what happens, I'll go back to the, um, the hairdresser, is has some shampoo on the shelf to sell to you, when they buy that product, technically it's not an expense because what they're doing is swapping cash, an asset for the bottle of shampoo that's an asset. The business is still in the same financial position as far as the financial systems are concerned. When it's sold, now we've made a profit, so now we'll record the expense. So a little bit technical there. That's why you do stock takes uh, in accrual based accounting. So a little bit technical there, but just Again, I wouldn't be terribly worried about that. We move on to the balance sheet, the next part, and this shows the value and indicates the health of your business. Now, this is really, really important because the value of a business ultimately is what it's all about. You go back to thinking about public companies. What are public companies? And, and if you go and look at some of the history of where public companies come from, you've got you know, ships sailing out of the Netherlands and people are putting in their money to go off to um, the East Indies or West Indies and make voyages and, and bring, uh, collect 
collect things, spices, breadfruit. Captain Bly was on his trip to uh, produce breadfruit, breadfruit and then they bring it back and they sell it all off and they get the profit. The, the value of all of the assets is what the business is worth. Public companies, it's the shareholding that's important. Shares go up because of the value of the business and it's about their assets. And it does tell you there's lots of ratios on there, which we won't go into, that accountants will go into um, to tell you about the health of your business. There's these three main things, assets, liabilities, and equity. Uh, equity. So equity is the, the value that's left over, if you like. If you're a private person, private organisation, then the equity is what's left over for you. That's your, if everything was sold off, that's what you're going to end up with. Assets, you'll see on there that you've got current assets. So they're things that we consider liquid. So typically within 12 months that you'll be able to realise that asset. So cash, um, uh, money, it's got trade debtors on there. So money that people owe you is, is fairly liquid. But then you've got fixed assets, just means it's going to be, you know, they're not something that you sell off or the intentions to sell off or to, to get the money from the actual cash value or we've got vehicles, might be land um, only holdings, any of those sorts of things on there. And then liabilities, pretty simply, what you owe. So trade creditors, who do you owe money from? It's pretty important that your debtors, the people that owe you money or overall your assets are more than your, your liabilities. Uh, trade debtors, I always want to see. So it's one of the things I look at first thing. I'll plug my book, Trader's Guide to Instant Cash Flow. First thing we look at is who owes you money? Stop doing more work, go and collect the money that's owed to you. Um, liabilities in there. So I want to see that I'm owed more money than I owe. Basically, that's what I would like to see in a business. The GST is on there, see? So that wasn't on the profit and loss. You can be showing that you're profitable, but your GST liability is building up. We haven't taken care of it. Uh, down the, If you go down just above total non-current liabilities, you've got some bank loans in there. So we want to know about all of those. One of the things that happens there is uh, um, vehicle loans are one of those things. Owners' drawings or director's loans are appearing on the balance sheet. They can be sucking money out of the business, but they're not appearing on the profit and loss. So one of the reasons you could have a profit and loss saying $50,000 worth of profit, but you've spent $10,000 in cash because it's not tax deductible on the loan of your vehicle. You spent $30,000 taking money out of the business that hasn't gone through as a wage, it's not appearing on the profit and loss. So very, very easy to in, eat into that profit, that taxable profit on your profit and loss by money that is not tax deductible. So that's in many ways my main point to make about these financials and why our cash management system um, will work along the way. So hopefully that makes some so you've got to be careful about that. On that sheet that I mentioned before, this one, that's why I have those loan payments. It's really any money going out that doesn't appear on your profit and loss. So as I said, is it, is it vehicle loans? Now check with your accountant, depending on how the vehicle's financed, they might be tax deductible, but most of them nowadays are shut on mortgages and things that they're not. Um, any of those things that are going out uh, that will be on your balance sheet, or you can just check your transactions from your bank account. That's what we do with things um, that aren't on your profit and loss. Make sure you write them down to be aware of them because they're going to come up as we go into the break even. So here's the next slider question. Do you have a bank account specifically for uh, tax or GST? Are you setting that money aside? So way back when GST came out, I was with Commonwealth way back then, and they immediately allowed a free bank account for GST to be put into. And it's one of the big problems with business nowadays is that um, people are getting stuck with GST because they're using that tax. Kylie, good to see that you got that. Thank you. If you don't do, if you only do one thing as a result of this webinar, it's please go and set yourself up a GST account at a minimum and start putting some money aside into it if you're paying GST. And super, yeah, no Slido link in the chat. I'll, I'll go back here and give you the, <clears throat> so it's not that question, it's the other question, but that's the QR code. And if you just type slido.com and go to AH2, that will get you there.
Okay, just answer that question at the moment. Yes, 70% of people, woohoo, well done guys. That's awesome. We're gonna talk more about bank accounts. They are actually your savior. So where did we get up to? There. Do you have a bank account specifically for tax GST? That is awesome. If you don't, please go and do that. I'd say stick tax in there as well, or otherwise run a separate one for tax. If the, whatever works for your brain, we'll be discussing that in just a sec. Really important. Um, again, just covering off on that. Assets, what you own, liabilities, what you owe, equity is the, oh, you can't see it on there, outcome. Sorry, <laughs> I haven't done the change of colour there very well. Equity is the outcome. And ultimately, that's what the business is worth. When people buy businesses, again, people tend to buy businesses on the profit and loss and what sort of profit and you pay as a multiple of profit, but there's all the assets, all the equipment, all the, you know, the other value of the business lies in the balance sheet. And uh, if it's being done well, people will get an expert to look at the statement of cash flows. Now, it takes a special technique in most accountants, um, uh, tax accountants that we have just out around the place. They'll advise you on tax. Uh, so just be careful. But you should be also, you know, plug for the accountants. I'm a great believer that you should be going to the minimum of twice a year to plan your tax out. You should be looking forward. You shouldn't be looking backwards. Looking backwards is useful, uh, but we've got to look forward. The other thing on here is the break even point. So I'm going to show you how very quickly, but I'm actually going to, uh, I've got a spreadsheet where you can do all of this really simply. You're just going to have to email us to get the template. We're not uh, just going to make it available. You just need to email to get it. The revenue required to pay all your expenses. Now I put in there should include all cash outgoings because the formula I'm going to give you works on the profit and loss, but you need to include to really understand because this is where people get in trouble. It's like I've got to break even on the profit and loss. Like you've got to have enough revenue to cover that car loan, to cover your drawings, to cover your tax, to cover everything that you are paying for in cash. Break even point, your fixed expenses, which you've got written down, your gross profit margin. So converting the gross profit to a percentage, uh, multiply that by 100 or just make it a decimal. So if it's 48% gross profit, then make it 0.48. Um, that will give you your break even point. The, the cost of the cost of goods is being taken into account because we're using the gross profit margin. The, the reason that we use that is then as the business grows, technically the fixed expenses should stay the same, theoretically I should say, even though they will actually grow, uh, but the margins on things should stay the same. If, it, if you're buying shampoo for a dollar and selling it for three dollars, doesn't matter whether I sell one bottle or a thousand bottles, it's still the same uh, percentage involved in that. So that's simply how you work out your break even point, but do use all your cash things there. There's the example, 41,000, 48% uh, gross margin is what that's saying, multiplied, so you divide it by that, multiplied by 100, again, the same as dividing by 0.48, will give you a break even point at 86,000. You should know that daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, if you like, annually, the break-even spreadsheet I give you will allow you to work that out. And that will tell you on the sample that I have there, it will tell you, well, in day 14 is when you actually start making money. It's an important thing for you to know. And also so that you can check back, well, do I need to increase my prices, um, fix some expenses in there? You know, what do I need to do to make sure that we're staying here so we can provide the service that we want to? It's not just about, and it mightn't be about at all for you making as much money as you possibly can. Um, for most businesses, that's actually not the case. I would say the business owners I work with, they want to have a comfortable living. They want to enjoy their life, enjoy their family and do what they do. So you're just going to make sure you're there to do it. Here's the next question for you on Slido. What do you know about profit first? So I'm putting in, I work with a profit first professional. So we'll see if anyone else. Oh, what's that 67% work with a profit first professional? That might still just be me. I wonder if anyone else does. Heard of it. Okay. All right. Well, this is our cash management strategy. 
we're going to change things up a little bit from our equation before. Our equation before was, can I find it? Can't find it. Where's it gone? Here we are. In our equation before, we had we brought in our income, we paid for our cost of goods, we paid our expenses, and hopefully we were left over with some profit. We're going to change that around. We're going to change it around. So we're going to bring in our sales or income. Now, the sales is there because this is the IP of an organization known as Profit First. Okay. So it's got to stay there as sales. It's in the book called Profit First by a guy called Mike McCallowitz. One of the things you can get from me is the five core chapters of that book. You'll see the little badge on there that says I'm a Profit First. A professional, a certified master. That's the highest level you can get. There's nine of us in the country. What this equation says is bring your sales in, bring your income in, take profit out, then go and pay your expenses so that every transaction we have is driven to put profit as a cash excess, more money than you need to run the business, aside for you to use as the owner of the business just like public companies do. Public companies take money, they have their excess cash, and they decide how much of that will be given as a dividend to the shareholder, shareholders. As a, as a owner of a business, you're a shareholder of the business, that's separate to running the business. It's separate to being the CEO, separate to being a worker, they're all different jobs. One of your roles there is simply a shareholder, and it's saying we're going to give you a dividend for being the owner of the business. If you've been like me, mortgaged a house, you know, put money into your business. Well, if you did that with shares, you'd get a return. Why wouldn't you for taking the risk of mortgaging your house uh, or just going into a business, even if that's not what you've done, then it's about you know, getting a return on that investment. Ultimately, you can do with that what you want. So that's what this is about. This goes back to the thing that I said that people say to me, the accountants told me I'm making some lovely money, but where's the cash? Okay, so this is about, well, we're going to show you the cash. I say profit first, this idea uh, turns your profit into cash. So it's not just a number on a piece of paper. You've actually got cash in the bank. And from that, you can destroy debt. And then once you've gotten rid of debt, you can invest for the future. Okay. Profit first is a very simple system. You might have heard of The Barefoot Investor. It's a, it's a very, very well-known book in Australia. I found in my years growing up that the best thing I did to maintain my cash flow for myself was to make small payments on things along the way. I didn't go uh, to, well, I did go to university straight out of school, and that didn't work very well. So I went back as a mature age student. So I went to university at 30 years of age, and with three children, a mortgage, a car payment, all those sorts of things. It was pretty tough. I worked weekends and whatever, so tough financially. I loved it. Um, but it meant things like electricity. In those days, we had this stuff called cash. Some of you might have come across it. And uh, I would get $20 and I'd go to the electricity because we had an actual office in out at East Teakley on the Central Coast. And I'd go in there on a Friday afternoon and I'd pay $20 onto my electricity account. So I didn't get this big bill. In the old days, when I first got paid, my first job was KFC, and I got paid in cash in a little yellow packet, about $7.24 for 15 hours of work or something. Back then, you know, you got your money in cash. As I got older, that grew a little bit bigger. When I was driving trucks, it was a couple of hundred dollars a week. The idea, it's the old envelope system. In my book, plug for my book again, uh, I call it the Kelly cash flow system because it was taught to me by a friend's father, which was simply when the cash comes in, have an envelope for your rent, have an envelope for your groceries, have an envelope for your electricity. You take a little bit of money out and put it in the envelopes. Profit first is in its simplest sense, just doing that for business. So personally, what do I do? I've got a GST account. I've got a separate tax account. I've got a um, I've got a motor vehicle account because we run three vehicles through the business. I have uh, the first person who gets paid every week is my wife, uh, so that money goes off. That's part of um, yeah. Then we have the household expenses. So I have different bank accounts set up instead of envelopes nowadays. 
in order for the money to be put into, and we do that according to percentages about how much we need, the money just gets put into those bank accounts every Monday. So for instance, when the loan payment, every vehicle I have has a loan payment on it comes up, I'm not looking at a bigger bank account saying, oh, is there the money there for that loan account this week? No, it's just there because quite simply what I've done is work out the cost of those vehicles over a year, divided it up into um, 52 payments, and then just every week I, I put that percentage of an income or that amount of money into a bank account so that it's there. That includes maintenance and things. We're not having to look at that big bank account and juggle it to decide whether or not money is going to be there. So that, that, that's the very simplest view of what we're going to talk about right now. Profit first, I'm going to do this pretty quickly to tell you about why it works, how it works and why it works, as opposed to doing things on spreadsheets um, and just trying to juggle it in your, in your bank account. What I find most people do nowadays is they keep looking on their phone at their bank account to see if there's money there or they go online to see if there's money there. But what I can do is look at my bank and uh, with my different bank accounts there, I can go, oh yeah, there's money there for the vehicle account. How much is in my operating expenses account? Cool, I run a thing called a, a client account, client care account, and my one of my employees, is her title is client concierge, uh, or as she calls herself, magic elf. She's my magic elf and, and money goes into there a percentage of our revenue goes into there to look after clients. Like I've got my client day on Thursday and that's paid for out of that account. I don't have to worry about it. You know, that runs Christmas parties, gifts, all sorts of things for clients along the way. And the big thing with Profit First is we end up with profit in an account that's in excess to the money we need to operate the business. And everything about the business is reverse engineered to make that profit. We decide what percentage profit we want, we reverse engineer the business to make that happen. Okay, very straightforward. Uh, my daughter got married last year, we set up an account. So I use it personally as well. We set up an account for that and part of the money coming in just went into an account so that um, there was no stress about paying for her wedding. So let's get into it and have a look at it. Um, <clears throat> how do you be fit? Interestingly, profit first, the psychology and behaviour behind it came from the health industry. Mike Michalowicz, the author of the book, was at a conference and listened to somebody speak and went, you know what, that's exactly what I need to make sense of how profit first works and why it works, the psychology and behaviour. And this is about, the financial statements are about logic, profit first is about behaviour. It's all about just making behaviours work. So this is the order we're going to go in. Plates, veggies, temptation, frequency. What does that mean? Small plates. Very quickly, over the years, our plate size has increased the diameter by something like 25% which means our, our surface area is about 50% greater if you do the maths. I'd have to do the maths again on that. So we just eat more. We eat what's on the plate is the basic thing that happens. We eat what's on the plate. So if you reduce the plate size, studies have shown that people will just eat what's on the plate and therefore they're eating less. We, you know, we keep getting told the way to get fit uh, or fitter is to eat less, exercise more. So simply taking that strategy makes it work. It comes from a thing called Parkinson's Law. Um, in its simplest version, Parkinson's Law says two things. Uh, it's a bit like the law of vacuum. Things will expand to occupy the space or time that's allocated. So if you've got three hours to do a job, you'll take three hours. If you're given one hour to do the same job, you'll get it done in an hour. Toothpaste is a great example. When you start with the toothpaste that's full, we tend to put lots and lots of toothpaste on there and away we go. But when we get down the end, if you're like me, you're squeezing every last skerrick of toothpaste out of that thing to make, it, to make it work. So by reducing our plate size, we're doing the same thing. We're gonna open up bank accounts for the different parts of your business. One for profit, one for you to get paid, one for expenses, one for tax, you can have a separate one for GST. So in its simplest form, that's what we do. We have five bank accounts that are running. 
By putting less into each bank account, the psychology is I'm not opening it up going, oh, look at all that money. I can go and buy that thing like we do at home. Oh, I've got that, that money in there. I can buy that thing. But we haven't, we're not counting on the thing that's coming up next week. So very simply, that's what having this, the separate bank accounts is about putting smaller amounts into each one as we um, go along. Uh, then what we do, so we have it set up like this. There's the bank accounts, have an income account where the money comes into and its, it's total job is to receive money and then it distributes it out to the other bank accounts and that's done on a percentage basis. So in this business, we've worked out that 5% of that money will be for profit. So everything else then gets reverse engineered from that. The owner is going to get 50% of that money in a smaller business. These numbers are actually based on research of what actually happens in the United States. We're a bit different here because of tax. 15% goes off to tax and 30% to expenses. And we just make those distributions. But now we've got a smaller plate. There's only 30% only sitting in expenses. So we've got to make sure that that's all we're spending. And the, the premise is because there's only 30% there, rather than what was there before, all of it, where we are less likely to spend more than we have because the money's just not there. We're looking at, oh, we can't spend it. Number two, veggies first. We're told, eat the good things first, not the bad things. So what we need to do is um, eat, the, eat the veggies. Veggies, in this case, is profit. They're the good things for you. If you want to keep your business going, it's got to have enough money to be sustainable. So it needs to make some profit. Profit that you as an owner can do with what you want. It's not profit to invest back in the business. This is over and above that. We might set up an account for that. But now, you know, you've got money set aside, whether it's make donations, charity, whatever. Some of my clients run charity accounts and they have a set percentage go into that and they don't take it as profit, but the business is geared towards making sure that they have those donations um, available all the time. Uh, then there's this, remove temptation. So what we mean by that is instead of uh, just having everything in the one bank, you actually put it in different bank accounts. Simple thing. If I want to lose weight, what do I do? I need to not have the chips in the cupboard and the ice cream in the fridge. If it's not at home, I can't eat it. So the same thing happens with our profit account and our tax accounts. We put them in a different financial institution. So we're not looking at them going, oh, I do have that money there. I could use it. We want to leave them untouched so we don't get into trouble. So we put them in a different bank. So that's what I do. I have a main bank that I bank with. Um, and if you want to find out about those, you can ask me. I won't endorse anyone in particular on here. They're all free bank accounts, by the way. We do not use bank accounts that cost money. So I have the main bank account where transactions are taking place. And I have a bank that has my profit. And I have a bank that, that um has my tax, so that's separate, it's out of mine, it just gets put there and left for when I need to spend it. The last thing we do then is this thing called rhythm. So again, you know, what do you do? You, do, you can't go and exercise for one week of the year and then go on fit. We need to have a regular basis of that taking place. So rhythm is all about that. Instead of what most business owners do, is um, the bill comes in, they're always juggling for money to pay the bill or sitting down, at, maybe they do it once a month, but they're juggling around trying to pay the bill. In the book, Mike talks about this system called the 1025 rule, which is on the 10th of the month and the 25th of the month is when you pay attention to your, to your bills and the money coming in. Uh, personally, I do it every week. Strangely enough, at Profit First Professionals headquarters, they do it every week as well. I don't know anyone who only does it on the 10th or 25th. That was just what he wrote about at the, the time. So on a Monday morning, I sit down and I have a look at the income that's come in and then I distribute it off to the different bank accounts. So when I just go back to this one. So Monday morning, I have a look at my income account, the one in the middle, that's got all the revenue in it. And I've got percentages worked out as to how much I'm going to get, how much is going off to profit, how much to tax. And I simply transfer the money off to those accounts. From a bookkeeping point of view, 
That's all that is extra that is actually happening in your accounts. And you can set up a rule within your books, whether it's MIOB or Zero or QuickBooks, whatever you happen, have, happen to have, and that will take care of that. It means it's a bit like intermittent fasting to me. What's important about intermittent fasting? Well, you might do it with keto, so it's important what you eat, but intermittent fasting is about when you're not eating. And you're not thinking about it. I actually find days when I do a fast day, I'm far less concerned about eating than I am on days when I'm eating. So by doing this on every Monday, it means my fasting in terms of this is I'm not looking at it for the rest of the week. For another week, the financials are out of my mind. I'm not stressing about it. I've taken care of them for the week. And because the money's been building up, the money's there. And getting going, it can take a little bit more because you might have some you know, leftover bills that you have to pay, but that's where we put a profit plan together to make sure that this all works. So again, going through that um, pretty quickly at the moment to give you the, uh, the idea of what happens. What that leads to is this, if you look at the top, the first thing you have to do is know your cash. So you have to analyze what's going on with your cash. How much am I spending on expenses? How much on cost of goods? How much on tax? How much on GST? How much do I need to take out? So you need to work out what those percentages are. Next thing that you do is grow the cash by allocating the money out and allowing some for, for profit. We'll probably start by actually looking at your expenses and seeing what you can get rid of. A lot of the time, because this is what happens with, with when it's all in the one bank account, we just spend some money that we don't really need to spend. We can get rid of it. Just like if I'm going on a diet, guess what? I probably don't need to have that pack of chips or bag of lollies. I can just get rid of it. There's typically money there. I always say to people, you show me a million dollar business, I'll, I'll find you $50,000 like that. With profit first, what I was able to do was say, well, you know what, you, you show me your business, I'll show you how to make profit, how to actually have cash profit set aside whilst taking care of everything else in your business uh, without any stress at all. I can guarantee that that's gonna happen if you, if you do what we say. So analyze your cash, know what it is, uh, grow your cash by allocating it out, including up to profit. Um, then you accumulate that and then you work on more cash. So once we've done that for a cycle, we put in some extra strategies to see how we're going to improve it. And then we measure it just like you do when you're working with the patient, where you work out what's going on with them. You come up with an initial strategy, you work on that, they come back and see you, you, you redetermine what the next strategy is going to be to move them forward in their, in their progress with their health. And then what we do, once we've got that more cash, then you take some cash out and you repeat the cycle over and over again. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Most important thing is that you stick with it. So again, the simplest thing about Profit First, it is actually based on cash, real cash going in and out of your business. All you have to do in the simplest form is set up some bank accounts and say, oh, I'm going to put tax away here. I'm going to put money away from me here. I'm going to put my operating expenses. So I have a smaller bank account for operating expenses down there, my cost of sales. I guarantee you it will transform your business if you do that. So, whew. That's all from me talking at you for all of that time. What we need to do is stop and think, what are three lessons, three ideas, three reminders I got from going through all of that? And once we have those, what are three actions you're going to take to improve the financial performance, the management, the leadership within your business, whatever it happens to be? That's my question for you. There are questions for you to ask. Happy for you to put some answers in the chat. That's really important that you just stop and go, oh, what have I learned and what am I going to do about it? Um, it's only knowledge is only powerful if you take some action with it. That's me, Charles. Uh, I will just show you the what I've got. So you can email kcv at marcuscrowick.com.au. I'll put that back up for you again. Um, I've got here, you've had the financial mastery checklist. Uh, what's the other thing? Uh, if you want the profit first bank allocations, I can send you that. Main thing I've got for you is this break even analysis. I had something else somewhere. Um, 
break even analysis where you can just throw your numbers in here and it does all the calculations for you tells you what your sales need to be your fixed cost per day tells you how many days it's going to be until you um, break even as well so that's a really useful slide i've got something else somewhere uh, that we'll actually get again you just have to email casey and she'll send that through any questions uh, happy for you to contact me um, yeah that's it great thank you so we do have four minutes left of our session today so if you do have any final burning questions for marcus um, you're welcome to unmute and ask them now or type them in the chat um, you probably seen in some of the email communications I've sent out to you that we also are accepting uh, questions outside of the webinar. So there is a form that we've created where you can um, submit those questions and then Marcus collates them and provides a video response. So we'll try and get that out obviously once we get a few questions together. So it'll be in the coming weeks. So uh, what I'll do is I'll post, I'll send you that link in an email this afternoon. Um, so you have that handy. Um, so the other thing I had, Charles, sorry, was um, the five core chapters of Profit First. As a as a certified Profit First professional, I'm licensed to distribute those five core chapters. Uh, it's a really good book. He's a really good storyteller. If you, if you want just to read the five core chapters again, email Casey and she'll send those out to you. Just put templates in the headline. She'll know what it's about and she'll send those things um, out to you. Great. Thanks, Marcus. So um, so you'll see that I've posted the link in to Slido again in the chat. That's because you'll see now that the evaluation survey is live. So that's in the same place you were doing all of your poll questions. Um, so we'd love your feedback if you could please fill that out. Um, and I'll need you to fill that out if you would like a certificate of attendance for today's session. Um, as mentioned, the session has been recorded. So if you'd like to rewatch this um, and also a copy of the slides, um, they'll be available on our website. So if you're not familiar with our education library, you just head to our homepage, which is thephn.com.au. And in the top right hand corner, you'll see a tab for education. So we'll always have them all in the one place for you. Um, our next session, session three, is being held on Wednesday, the 27th of April. Um, this will also be a lunch session. And then sessions four and sessions five will be in the evening. Um, all the details are on that original flyer, so please uh, register for those uh, when you get a chance. Um, I think that's all I needed to touch base with. Um, was there any questions in the chat before we finish up? I've seen Jody's uh, read it and implemented it. Good on you, Jody. That's fantastic. Need any help? Just uh, give me a yell. Really important that you come back and do that. You know, analyze and allocate and accumulate every quarter at a minimum, uh, you know, today, uh, again, you know, a lot of information for a short session. So we've touched the surface of it. Please reach out for further explanation. I'd be very surprised if you uh, really, uh, you know, got all of all of that. We're just making some points today. Uh, pleasure, Kylie, love doing these things. And Dwight, um, yeah, Sally, plenty to, certainly plenty to, work on. We've got lots of resources to help you there. If you want, just reach out and ask the question again. If you want a, a private response, again, you can you can either send it to Charles or to me if you don't want it to be a video response. A couple of them have been, you know, I, I'll do them as a general one, but if you want a private response, please just reach out. That's what we're here to do. Just like you guys work on people's health, I work on, the, on businesses' health. Um, Nothing, well, one of the most stressful things we know in life is the finances of life. And if we can fix that. Vanessa, there is a recording. Yep, that's right. So uh, it's in our education library as well, Vanessa. So just head to our homepage uh, and then click on the education tab. All of our recordings for all of the webinars that we run from the through the PHN are there. So it'll um, they're all in chronological order. So just have a scroll through and you'll find it. Um, I've also just quickly posted there in the um, in the chat is that link to the online form. So if there's any questions you have, uh, click that link, type them in, and we'll provide a video response um, in the coming weeks. So I think that's yeah. all, Marcus. Uh, I'll just answer Kylie there. Kylie, the, the gross um, profit margin, I think there was a slide on it. Otherwise, I'll, I'll 
do a video on that. I imagine there'll be a few videos come out of this to show you how to do that. That spreadsheet, you can just put in the numbers from your profit and loss and those extra ones I was talking about from your uh, balance sheet and it will do the calculations for you. It, it, it's, it's basically, if you sell something for, for $10, and you made six dollars on it then it's six out of the ten was profit so that's sixty percent that's all it's doing to calculate gross profit i'll do a video on it Charles yeah <laughs> sounds good marcus <laughs> thank you all right everyone thanks again for joining us um, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon thanks alicia